Hello! Uh, this is the part where we insert the obligatory acknowledgement that it's been a really long time since I've done this and that I'm like maybe gonna make some vague promises to do this more consistently in the future, but like we all know that suspect and honestly no one cares! Right, so after BookNet Fest last year I started watching a lot more booktube. I had already been watching a fair amount because certain people that I knew or followed had like drifted into making booktube stuff. And it just so happens that January has been like the most productive reading month that I've had in a really long time. And so in the interest of trying it out and also because my accountability group meets this weekend and I have to make a video, uh, I am going to do a January reading wrap up. I read eight books in January and honestly like personal life is like a huge factor here but also uh, I found a delightful spreadsheet that a booktuber made and I'm forgetting her name but I will link the video in the description and I just really love looking at this spreadsheet and so I feel like it encourages me to read more because I'm like oh I want to enter more things into the spreadsheet and like see more data about my books. I mentioned this spreadsheet because according to the spreadsheet my current average star rating for the books that I've read this year is 3.9. So in addition to reading eight books, which is more than I've read in a month in, I don't know, years, uh, <laughs> I also liked them. So yay! The only physical book on this list is a library book that I already returned, so I'm not gonna be able to like do the proper booktuber thing and like hold up all my books. I guess this is also a good place to mention like reading goals for the year. Uh, my official Goodreads goal right now is 52 two books, although I, because of how many I read this month, part of me is like, maybe I should make it more. I don't know. Um, uh, beyond that, my other like big reading goal is to try to get through all of the audiobooks that I purchased in 2018. I started the year off with a reread of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility. I'll be honest, I did this almost exclusively because Rosamund Pike reads this audiobook and I bought it as like as soon as I realized that she did. I read most of Jane Austen um, just sort of on my own over the span of a couple months when I was about 20 years old and Sense and Sensibility was is not one that like stood out to me as something that I particularly enjoyed and I truly would not have cared to revisit this were it not for my undying love for Rosamund Pike's narration of Pride and Prejudice so I was like okay I gotta like give it a shot. I loved all of the abundant sister feels. The audiobook narration was of course everything that that I knew it would be. The ending of this book kind of bothers me. I don't particularly like the way that Marianne Dashwood is like treated by the novel. She's essentially reduced to a prize to be won by this dude, which I don't know, bummed me out when I got there, which is like the least eloquent discussion of a Jane Austen novel ever. But there you have it. But I do love Jane Austen's writing and the like sister feels really got to me and uh, the narration again was fantastic. So this will definitely be added to my books to fall asleep to when I'm having anxiety rotation. So this one got three stars. The second book that I read was Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. This is a short and weird little book about a woman named Kiko who was always considered strange as a child and as an adult she just really loves working in a convenience store. At 36 years old she is really happy with her life as a convenience store worker but over the course of the novel she sees that people who are maybe nice to her um, secretly view her as broken in some way and so this is the story of her navigating those expectations and what she actually wants. It seems likely that she is on the autism spectrum, that that is not explicitly stated in the book. For such a short book, it's only 136 pages, it packs a really impressive emotional bunch. The moments where she is starting to understand how other people see and perceive her are like heartbreaking and I just wanted her to be able to be happy at her convenience store. I kind of felt like the story was keeping me at arm's length for, for most of it and I don't know if that's just like the nature of the character or the fact that it's so short, not really sure, but I gave this three out of five stars. The third book that I read this month was Madeline Miller's Sarah this was one that I checked out from the library but which I would like to purchase a copy of just so that I can have it because I adored this book. It's a glorious work of Greek mythology fanfic basically. Uh, Cersei is a character who appears in the Odyssey and Madeline Miller sort of fills her and her world out. If you love mythology or adventure stories of any kind I cannot recommend this book enough. It was wonderfully paced and just like all around a good time. I, I had so much fun reading this book. This should not be surprising at this point but I gave it five stars. The next book I read was So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijoma Aluo. This was another 2018 audible purchase that I'd had for a really long time so we're you know two down so many more to go. This book is exactly what the title promises. It is a work of nonfiction that is a really thoughtful and clear exploration of how to have conversations about race. Specifically in an American context as Ijoma Aluo is American 
African-American herself. She's also a biracial woman, which certainly informs a lot of her experiences. She talks a lot about the conversations that she's had with her white mother about race. She is really thoughtful about intersectionality and about acknowledging, you know, her own process of learning things. I cannot recommend this book enough. I gave this five out of five stars. The next book I read was Emergency Contact by Mary H.K. Choi. This is a contemporary YA romance about two characters named Penny and Sam. Penny is an angsty but very smart Asian American teenager who goes off to college and through her freshman roommate she meets Sam and she helps Sam in sort of a bizarre circumstance and puts her number in his phone as an emergency contact. Um, because of Sam's ties to the, the roommate, she keeps it a secret that they know each other, but the two of them, Penny and Sam, sorry, Penny and Sam, uh, have a friendship almost exclusively through text message. And so uh, that's like the bulk of the novel is just them exchanging cute and funny texts, but also they're like very brooding <laughs> and emotional. There are a lot of sort of YA romance like hallmarks and staples in this book, but the writing was really, really lovely and charming. And I just, I like one sped through this book and also really enjoyed it. I gave this book four out of five stars. The next book I read was Anansi Boys by Neil Gaiman. This is the third of my uh, 2018 Audible purchases that I made my way through. So I'm getting there. I'm making progress. I got this book mostly because um, American Gods has a full cast on Audible. It's one of the first books that I read after I got my account, uh, That which is fantastic, by the way. I highly recommend. But I this is an American Gods book, so I was intrigued. I'm wary of talking about this book because I know that other people are a lot more sensitive about spoilers than I am, and so I don't know. The parameters of American Gods also apply in, in this book, but if you have never read American Gods, which you absolutely do not need to do in order to read this book, the, that will not become clear to you until well into it. This is going so well. Anyway, this book follows a character named Fat Charlie. At the beginning of the novel, he is about to get married and uh, his fiance encourages him to track down his estranged father. But when he does, he finds that his father has passed. Um, but after his father's passing, he learns that he had a brother that he never knew about. And so he then reconnects with his brother. And there's all sorts of family shenanigans. I'm so bad at this synopsis without spoilers thing. I didn't care quite as much about Fat Charlie as I did about Shadow, so that was a little disappointing. I'm not sure how I would have felt about this book if I hadn't had those expectations going into it. The mythology components, though, were woven in just as deftly as they were in American Gods, and it was a wonderfully written and delightful adventure, so I gave this book four out of five stars. The next book that I started to read was The Animators by Kayla Ray Whitaker. I had to say that so slowly, that's like the, the 19th time that I've tried to say her last name, uh, but <laughs> I, I, I've been struggling a little with that one. Hopefully that will be my first completed book in the February version of this because instead of finishing that, I moved on to Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan. I first discovered Jennifer Egan when I was in high school and read Look at Me, which I thoroughly enjoyed and I kind of want to reread just to see, you know, how I feel about it 15 years later. But uh, a few years later, I saw a visit from the Goon Squad and recognized her name and that turned out to be one of my favorite books ever, in spite of it doing <laughs> two things that I generally that generally make me struggle to connect with a book, which is you know the shifting shifting narration and jump jumping around in time a bunch. <laughs> those two things are often like disconnect points for me, but she does both of those super super well in A Visit from the Goon Squad. Manhattan Beach uh, also has a little bit of that, but far far less. It, it's much more like conventionally structured. There are basically three main characters and only two major time jumps. That said, I don't think that she uses either of those things, the shifting narration or the, the time jumps, as effectively in Manhattan Beach as she did in Goon Squad. Of those three periods of time that the novel takes place over, the bulk of it is during World War II. While there are three characters who get sort of point of view chapters, Anna Kerrigan is the like main character, I would say, uh, of this book. She's a child in the first section and she's, I don't know, maybe 20, give or take, uh, during the, the bulk of the novel. And at some point in the, the in-between time, her father, Eddie Kerrigan, runs out on the family. One night she goes out with a new friend and she 
goes to a bar owned by a man named Dexter Stiles, who she recalls meeting in the novel's opening scene with her father. The three main characters of this novel are Anna, Dexter, and Eddie. Anna winds up getting close to Dexter and tries to find out what happened to her father, what their connection really was, because she never actually knew. Ultimately, Anna was the only character who felt truly fleshed out and realized to me uh, the, the like three separate threads of Anna, Dexter, and Eddie, while ultimately intertwined in a way that was, I guess, interesting. The storytelling often felt really just, I don't know, disconnected and discordant almost. Like it just, they, the stories felt almost like different books in a way. The bigger problem for me narratively though is that every peripheral character, everybody aside from those three people, seemed to be brought forward into the novel to do things that were always just really convenient for the plot. That said, there are a lot of wonderful conceptual things happening here. I like the way that this book explores like the idea of secrets and, and what they mean to people and the way in which the different threads are intertwined also like good. <laughs> I, uh, again, like I'm not sure how I feel about the execution of them, but like the, the idea, like the concept is very strong and I really do love Jennifer Egan's writing still. So I gave this book three out of five stars. The last book that I read this month was Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. This was a book club pick. This was my book club pick. I honestly did not know what I was getting into when I picked this book, uh, but we are kind of making our way through some of the 2019 Read Harder challenges. And so the very first challenge is a pistolary novel and I just Googled pistolary novels and I saw this at the top of the list and this is like a, you know, on many a best of list. I own and enjoyed housekeeping. So I was like, okay, cool. Marilyn Robinson. This seems like a book that people love. Let's go with it. Gilead is a very long letter written by a 77 year old man named John Ames who learns that he is dying, um, but has a six year old son and the knowledge that he is going to pass soon and will never know his child as a grown man. Uh, you know, is, is sitting with him. So he decides to write his son a letter. The novel takes place shortly before the election of Eisenhower. Ames is a reverend who is descended from a line of, of reverends. Um, his grandfather was an abolitionist and his father was an ardent pacifist. The book takes its name from the town, Gilead, Iowa, where John Ames lives. And it's a lot of him talking about life in this town and his life as a reverend and his family history. There's a sporadic quality to the storytelling that is very lovely and good and like feels very true. One day he sits down to, you know, tell this story about something that happened when he was 12. And then the next day he sits down and he's like, oh wow, you, my son, you're playing and that's cute. He also talks about his best friend a lot. Uh, my best friend said this and then he said that. My best friend did this other thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I would do too. In spite of this being a book written by a dying man, he's like a fairly, he's got a fairly joyful attitude about his life and like the, the, what he is trying to leave to his son. He seems like a really, really lonely dude. But uh, in spite of that, there is like, there's a joy to the writing of this very extensive letter. That said, there is uh, understandably a ton of religion in this novel. And I, I don't think that that is a problem. Like I think that that is necessary. I think that for me, it made it hard because there kept being references to explicit biblical things. And I just could feel the sense of disconnect between myself and the story, like the degree to which something is being said here that means something to a large portion of the audience. Like you've just said, uh, like, referenced a specific section of the Bible. I don't even know how to describe the like number, you know, Genesis numbers, numbers. What is that? I don't know. And every time the book does it, I'm aware that the book is saying something that I'm not getting. And so, you know, it's not that it, you know, makes it not make sense, but it does make me very aware of the distance between me and John Ames. There are a lot of really lovely and interesting bits where he is navigating, um, ideas of faith that I, I really loved and like that stuff was great like I, truly it was the specific moments where he references passages of the bible that I just had this moment of I feel like you're saying something here <laughs> and I wish I got it but I don't and I'm certainly not gonna like stop reading to go look it up. The sort of sprawling nature of the book while ultimately something that I loved about it uh, made it hard for me to get into at first and so I wound up switching to the audiobook fairly early on. Actually what I did was listen to the audiobook while also reading it which is my favorite way to read um, like a child. I had an interesting experience with this book and I would highly recommend it to any 
anyone with like sufficient religious background to understand all the things that I didn't understand. And I gave this book three out of five stars. I went back and forth, actually. Um, I, my spreadsheet and Goodreads, my spreadsheet says four, but Goodreads still says three. So um, I'm not sure. Three, three and a half stars. And that is all the books that I read in January. Um, I still have to finish The Animators and I have already started reading Shonda Rhimes' The Year of Yes. So that's some of what's what's coming in February. Let me know in the comments below what books you've read recently, what you're planning on reading this month, uh, anything that you think I should pick up in February. Uh, also, tell me how to do a plot synopsis without spoilers in uh, less than 20 seconds because that would be a cool skill to develop. Okay, bye!